I did it. I don't know. You can hear me. <laughs> so it's just basically yelling across the van like bamboo coral. <laughs> If you're still in a good place, Dan, can we look at this Yeah, one right I think here? it's funny that I Ooh, asked that Adam to sit for Brian because I couldn't identify coral, and then I <laughs> couldn't identify <laughs> the coral. <laughs> want to uh, push in there a bit, Daryl? Sorry, the kind of naked one there? No, the one behind it up behind here, it. that one. This is some type of primnoid. Just a little more. Yeah, beauty. I like the color on this one. It could mean no, this is where the debate I always have myself is: is this Norella, or is this Canadella? It ha it has some little pinkish colored things. Yeah, those are probably associates of some type. Maybe more anemones. What's right, the identifying that is good difference for us? For me to ask an expert what they th what genus they th I think that is. Roger, that was a floating one there, so we're yep. not... No, that's, that should okay. be an easy ID for wide. somebody Thanks. who's used to this family. But every time I think I'm getting to the point where I can ID these to the uh, genus level, I get told I'm wrong. Oh, no. I'll come uh, back up underneath you there. So we had a coral person come in and say that uh, that sea anemone with where it looked like it had a growth plate. So that bamboo corals can sometimes do that, and it's analogous to a burl on a tree. Mm. Yep, that's, that's definitely what I was kind of thinking as well, but it's great to have that confirmed. Yep, I'm coming up underneath Way to go, the online community. Should see my lights soon. Probably come up to 20 as I come under you there. So as we've made this transition into this area of higher coral density, we have lost most of the crinoids. I mean, this one being here kind of being the exception. Um, maybe you can't see its head right now because it's off fr frame, but we've seen a really stark transition in the community here from a community dominated, dominated by these stalked crinoids to one dominated by the octocorals with, frankly, very little apparent change other than the steepness has increased a little bit. Would that be differences in feeding regimes or just just because they're different species or wh why would that be? It could be a whole host of things and I don't have a good answer for you. It could literally be kind of a random process that the first couple of uh, sea lilies grew here are stalked crinoids and they reproduced and they spread and the corals just by some fluke of chance didn't land here at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and so it could be a random process. Um, Katie and I were having a long conversation last night about the role of random process in biology and we're realizing it really plays a pretty huge role, um, which is thoroughly unsatisfying for someone who spent the last five years trying to figure out the <laughs> rules that govern deep sea community ecology. And we're like, well, some of it's just random. <laughs> uh, makes it really hard. Yeah. Um, yep. But I think that certainly plays a significant role. Also, it could be current. It could be sediment load. Um, if, if it is current, it's probably some kind of feeding mechanism type thing. Um, there's a whole host of possible reasons in which we are just beginning to even tug at the string to kind of understand those questions in this depth. Brian, I have a question for you. It does seem like a lot of these corals don't have a ton of larger associates, like like starfish and 
squat lobsters and yep. other things, but mostly small, like the snail and the anemones. Is there something that drives that? Or First, do we you have to know? introduce yourself. You're going to ask a question now. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us your background. What's your role in the Nautilus? No. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name's Deb Smith. I'm sailing on Nautilus um, this expedition as the mapping coordinator. Um, so it's my job to collect all this bathymetry data before we dive. And um, I'm just sort of guest sitting in the van right now. I had dinner and thought it would be fun to come up and harass <laughs> the team a little bit <laughs> since I get to spend a lot of my time in the data lab downstairs, which um, is sort of tucked away. And uh, so I thought I would lob a question at Brian and ask a little a bit, bit about associates. Yeah. So I have so a Deb little is, bit Deb of background. Is, Deb is one of those one of the two probably of the mission side, uh, the, the science party, two of the unsung heroes along with the video team makes up the mapping team. And we couldn't do any of what we were doing out here without the high resolution map that Deb and her team make overnight and during transits uh, and on dedicated mapping cruises before we come out here with the ROV and do the flashy stuff um, with the big robotics. They use some insanely well-designed and sonar systems that the signal processing algorithms behind it just blow my mind that they can make the high resolution that maps they have in such a no using sound in such a noisy environment but back to your question deb i don't really know like well, yes you're we're we've seen for the most part these have been pretty associate light and the associates we have seen have been pretty small um, this has kind of been a low abundance um, medium diversity kind of dive in general um, Oh, is that a bath of pathies? That would be new. Yep. That's, can we look at this one, please? Yeah, I see it. Uh, um, come up. Uh, and, uh, maybe you're right. So, yeah, I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> but your, your observation, I think, is dead on for this dive in terms of it kind of being a lower diversity of associates even than we're seeing in corals. So this coral we are coming in now is our first black coral, potentially of the expedition, certainly of the dive today. This is uh, uh, an anthropotherium. Push which in is black coral in, in the uh, <coughs> uh, family Bathopathies, or actually genus Bathopathies. Um, and so this is uh, a more distant cousin to the okay, other corals we've been seeing. It's not an octocoral. They have a very different um, polyp structure that we'll see here in a second zooming in. So what makes um, them a black coral? Because it looks pretty pink to me. Yeah, their skeleton's black. So when they die, you can see a pretty clear black colored skeleton, but they, they alive, they are more often than not this mm -hmm. kind of pinkish red color. Okay, you can right. push in a bit more there. So. And you can see yeah, when we push in a bit more and, and the Ooh. focus comes up that you'll see that the tentacles here, the arms are individual growths off of the branch as opposed to having a very discreet polyp with a central mouth with eight ten, uh, arms around it. Um, so it's a very different polyp structure um, than we've been looking at in all the other corals so far along on this dive. Come down so five the meters. The mouths, right, all those millions of tentacles. I was afraid you were going to ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't remember, honestly. So is okay, each one of those tentacles, to, to make there, sure we further stump you, uh, is each one of those tentacles an individual uh, animal? The there. way that each polyp is an individual right. animal? I'm afraid I'm going to have to look that one up, too. <laughs> the only thing I know about black corals is right. there are different species, and some have the branches that are mm. cr exactly across from each other, and some have them alternating. And I can't tell you what the difference is. <laughs> <but> <laughs> I've heard that about bamboo corals, though, too. Yeah. Like, so the, the nodes are... Okay. There's something Go about right. them being directly across versus offset from each other yeah, so and I remember the last time we came out um, here uh, one of the scientists uh, Mary Deere was uh, she studies bamboo corals and she, I remember her giving a whole talk about the differences and I have no idea <laughs> 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 I wish I had that talk again yeah no I mean it's just one of those features that I think when you sit and listen to a lot of people try to identify um, you know various features of corals that help them determine um, you know narrowing down which which genus or species and I'm a terrible I'm not a biologist so I get those all mixed up um, you know the sort of alternating branches versus opposite branches is one of them mm -hmm. Um, but really, I was just trying to rescue Brian. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they are hexacorals. Um, so my guess is is they have. <clears throat> um, that's how often they have the, the their mouths per number of tentacles. So an online viewer did say pretty much just that. They are hexacoral, six tentacles per polyp, but the polyps are so hard to see, and they're located among the tentacles. Yeah, you can, uh, this should be all right. It's not okay. actually on Learned me. something about black corals today. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to my life. It's four hours of learning, which is awesome. So now as it's flattening out a little bit, we're seeing the, uh, the crinoids pop back up. So that mm -hmm. may be answering my earlier question about it, is that they're slope dependent here on where they're seeing, which kind of makes sense. They have a harder time holding on because of their, they're not glued into the uh, sediment as substrate you can, uh, the same way the bring uh, our head corals to the are. West. So how are they stuck on the rocks then if they're not glued in like the coral? Some of them hold, some of them have, some of them like literally hold muscularly and mm -hmm. others have a little bit more of an attachment point. Maybe uh, three, on the, 300 the so good hitting. Type of um, stalked carnoid. These are animals. Um, they, and, and many of them can't right, move right. and like walk. Tilt up a bit for us. So unlike starfish, they're just kind of stuck Lynette, there. We're ready to. Uh, no, they can, they can move around a bit. Or at least, some, at least some of them can. I think some of them are more permanently welded at their full adult <laughs> life stage, but some can move. Yeah, sounds really good to me. They they haven't complained, and uh, scientists haven't complained, so I think we're good. What do I need to complain <laughs> about? Oh, everyone <laughs> seems happy to continue the dive. Yes, we are certainly happy back here. <laughs> Roger. <laughs> Tilt up a bit for us, Ren. Roger. Uh, keep an eye on your altitude there, too. You're, uh, you're uphill from me at the moment. A.M. <laughs> <laughs> Give us that bottom time, Lynette. No, I don't want to sit on the social deck drinking coffee. <laughs> yeah, so. <coughs> I just came over the hill there, Ren, and then it's going downhill a little bit, so I should actually be back up underneath you. Let me mosey back up that way. Uh, yeah, sure, I'm going to come, like, just to the north of you. So you see on the sonar where your uphill is. So I'll try and be uphill of you and we'll kind of go sideways with the ship it's uh, following the contour line as opposed to going up the hill Definitely want to <coughs> definitely want to keep your altitude in the uh, teens with this weather. We can uh, delta, you know, whatever it is, depending on what we're doing. But are you happy here, Dan? Are you taking requests for zooms? Yep, absolutely. Can we take a look at 
this way. And the ones on the left are 20 meter divisions and that's Atalanta. The ones on the right are 10 meter divisions and that's uh, Hercules. All right. Let's look to the right. Look to your north a little bit for me, Ren. We'll mosey up that way a little. Uh, you can come up uh, five meters too, please. So, Dan, I feel like you're stealing one of my words when you're talking about moseying alarm along. <laughs> if you could say, get along, little doggies, too. Perfect. I spent a, thank you, I spent a significant amount of time in your neighborhood. Oh, yeah. Well, Which bless part? your heart. <laughs> We got an ID on that other than crinoid. <laughs> I think it's yeah. stock crinoid. Stock crinoid. Daryl, are you ready to take it to the next level on the wall? Let's go. Yeah. So what would it take to swap H11 and H12 into where the two annoying quads are and put the two Annoying quads where H11 and H12 are. Uh, maybe not so comfortable. Let me check that out. I still, I still can't hear you over there. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Is that a, is that a Dave thing? Uh, can come up a little bit, man, please. That might be a Dave thing. You're asking to move which ones? Um, you see where the, in monitor three? <coughs> yep. So you have the two quads, upper left and upper right. And then below that you have H11. And uh, then you have H12, which is my uh, illegal pilot camera. Oh, that's looking good though. It is looking sweet. Um, might be nice to have those those flopped just for a test. You know, you don't have to reprogram the whole system. You might get. Can we get a that. zoom on that anemone there? Sure. You can uh, push in halfway there if you want. Oh, look at that. Uh, I need to turn. Sorry, I have my pen. Yeah, no, it's I've seen yeah. enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have. I mean, there it is. It's not like it, a better look that I'm going to identify it. Oh, my God, though. That's a great that, shot. Yeah. The little shrimp in the background. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Save that for a highlight shot. Yeah, I could mention... Uh, been working with a graduate student at Rhode Island, uh, Pooja Banerjee, and she's written a machine learning algorithm that okay, should be able to take this. the whole mm -hmm. video and automatically extract little highlights like that. Oh, so we'll see how it works because we got it. I have it out here, and I'm gonna test it out. Really? What's that running on? Uh, just a laptop. <laughs> the, it, it took uh, kind of a high performance computing kind of cluster to develop the model, you know, with a, with, you know, hundreds of hours of video for training. But uh, now we can test the model just on a laptop. So is she going to, or is that person going to be coming out I later on this so. ex expedition season or doing it from the lab? She, yeah, she didn't want to come on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> it's not her jam. <laughs> She has to, though. 
She has to? She has to for us to graduate. For all of you to, if she doesn't do it, you don't graduate? Exactly. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> all for one and one for all. <laughs> so for the back row here, uh, uphill is um, basically this way, 315, but we're going not 315. You can come up a bit there, please, Ryan, up five. I don't know if we want to try and deviate to go up the hill or keep following the contour to the west. Or well, I, I feel like so far today we've been a little bit limited in direction of ship moves, yeah? So I would say... I thought that was just so you didn't wake me up with the bow <laughs> thruster. <laughs> the, you know... Uh, keep moving along the contour. Yeah, as much... Roger. You can keep bending to the to the north a little bit, as much as they're comfortable with. We've been on a bearing 300, zero, which should take us to waypoint two. Um, it, we're just not going perpendicular to the contours, but yeah. we will get there. Okay. Okay. Lynette wants to get over to all those. Yeah, I want to go over here where this super steep peak is. Yeah, Was it? <laughs> is it an innie or an Audi? A little hard to tell. Um, that's that's an Audi. Oh boy! How, how far away is the Audi? Um, let's see. Uh, six hundred and fifty meters to the peak. At this rate, that's what. 100 years. Yeah, oh, look totally. at this nice little colony on this boulder. That's worth looking at. Are those those little jellyfish again? Oh, I no, we're gonna see. Oh. From far away, it looks like it, but it could also be maybe like a lobster or something. Okay, crossing my fingers on some more little coral of ore jellyfish. Hmm. We gotta redeem ourselves from yesterday. <laughs> yeah. But it was pretty amazing to watch. Uh, just found out about the coral of ore jellyfish, and then there they were, just 10 minutes into our shift. So what kind of coral do we think this is? I'm asking more as a test question than because uh, uh -huh. obviously I, I probably know. So Adam, I think it's maybe time to head on out of that control van right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think they need you down below. <laughs> You see the banding? All right, bamboo. Huh, uh, this is a weird, a weird angle. Zoom in there. We'll get a good pull-up zoom we'll in there. We'll see what, maybe probably someone's chatting from shore and telling you. You can uh, go full zoom there. We'll get the what? And <coughs> what are those? Oh. Okay. Whoa. I want to uh, see a beautiful shot. Oh, that's a snail. Yeah. Try and bring the snail into the shot there. Man, that's the first snail that we've seen on this dive, isn't it? Oh, we can go home now. We've seen a snail. <laughs> <laughs> it is the first snail we've seen. Yeah. <laughs> All right, who had snail on the underwater bingo card? <laughs> Why don't we have that? We should have that. We a bingo card. Oh, you didn't get one? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All the cool people got one. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there it is, and there it goes. Sorry, just and trying to uh, get it, it in is. there. It's like it's teasing us, or Dan's purposefully teasing us, like, oh, I'm just going to make sure that you enjoy the snail for the 1.2 seconds. Trying to balance 5,000 pounds of vehicle on a marble <laughs> there. See him wedged on the porch and the manipulator. It's more of a bumper at this point than a manipulator. That's a great shot. Beautiful work, everyone. Try uh, playing with the focus a little there, Daryl. I 
that's all we got. Yeah, you have to uh, pull the zoom back just a little bit. So is that a type of vampire squid is my next focus. question. Yeah. That, that looks the snail? Mm-hmm. A vampire squid? Snail. Snail, yeah. vampire snail? Mm. I mean, minus the two shark fangs and the blood sucking capabilities. I don't, I don't know. Could be. A coralivore. Okay, if you, uh, <laughs> there is oh, a trick. Oh, you ate fast. If you use the, <laughs> All right, uh, lucky you guys. <laughs> I'm out. If you use the zoom and the focus at the same time, Daryl, you can slowly pull out and try and keep it in focus. There were some more of those jelly-looking things. Yes, on perfect. There's a bunch there they are. I don't know if you saw. Are these anything, or are these nothing? Okay, those are probably anemones. Push back in there a bit. Okay. Oh. Well. So. Those look like scared anemones to me. You want to stop her up there? Well, for we a got the phyla correct. Can we shift focus to this one here? What's that? The 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 and what I think is an anemone there. Can we focus on that one? The uh, Zeus has an issue once in a while. If you're at full zoom, you can't quite focus. It depends on how close I am, and that uh, coral's, you know, probably almost touching the camera there. So. Oh. You can push in a bit more, maybe. And play with your so focus. what caught my attention here is is the foot of the anemone, and this one is just a different color. That darker area. Yeah, the lighter area, right in contact here there with it is. the actual. Beautiful. Yep, that's exactly the shot I wanted. Um, but it doesn't help me understand what I'm looking at at all. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't quite understand what I'm looking at here. <coughs> it's almost like this coral skeleton is elongated here and the anemone sitting on it there. And I don't remember seeing that before. I'm used to seeing the anemones all the way around where it almost looks like the you know the coral is growing through the anemone. Um, and we've also got a little solitary hydroid living, it's going to be hard to tell, but right there, bouncing up and down. Sorry. There's a little solitary hydroid, it looks like, hanging out in there. Um, yeah, nice, pretty. This is the healthiest bamboo I've seen since we came on watch, at least. Um, it's still got a few ser areas of dead tissue, and <coughs> but compared to all of its compatriots, uh, uh, come, this is quite Come wide there a little, Daryl. So were you a master at Where's Waldo when you were a child? <laughs> Was that your favorite book? Or I the I Spy books? honestly don't remember. <laughs> You can see the coral moving them. I am touching it with the camera there. It's a little bit too close. All right, I think science is good here. Roger. Okay, you want to go wide for us? Let's back the camera up a little bit. One. Sure. Go ahead, Daryl. Push in a bit. So this looks like Chrysogorgia. Chrysogorgia. Push in a bit more. richer, darker color than I'm used to. Okay, so Chrysogorgia, Eridogorgia, bamboo corals are all in the same... They're all octocorals. All octocorals, okay. You know, I'm now I'm second-guessing myself. Those are some thick polyp stalks. Yeah, zoom right in for him so I can see the polyps. Too. Ooh, and we got the nice little, little baby sponges over here. I forget Aww. what those little ball sponges are, but... I didn't even notice that. So tiny. 
Oh yeah. There's oh, there's multiple of them. I didn't even yep. realize. There's three three different ones, and one has multiple stocks. There's a yeah. Europe Tychus uh, squat lobster in here, which are often, on, very, lower, very often associated with Chrysogorgia. So Just coming up, this pull, is pull a Chrysogorgia I don't recognize, but Whoa. I am relatively confident it's a Chrysogorgia. All right, science is happy. Roger. It okay, Dale, you can go wide, so and cool. you're good to come yeah. up if you need to. Right? But I think you're okay. Your altitude's back in the high teens there. Roger. I'm going to wait. So Atlantis moving off into deep water there to, to our left. So I'm to the north of you now, and the whole show is moving uh, moving west, basically. We're moving uh, basically 300 there, 280. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to stay to the north of you and kind of spin around here so we can see as we come down the hill. Right. Yeah, not bothered about the tether up at the moment. I'll spin back around when we uh Get to is the there, bottom of wherever is there we're going. Some, is there something on that crinoid? Maybe like a star or something? Yep, it's got a, it's got a brittle star on its back, uh, climbing up its stalk, and then there's another something coral. Can we take a quick look sure. at that? Push in there, Daryl. Mm. Right. Yeah, you can push in a bit more. This is another black coral, I believe. Looks mm. like it. Yep. Yeah. That's another black coral. That's another new one for the for today. All right, that should be good for an ID. Thank you, pilot. Right here. Okay, go ahead. Oh, I like that side camera right over there. So the viewers at home can't see it, but oh, it's so pretty. There's something about black coral in the base, right? I've always been told too, like to try to get a good identification on the black coral, they have to look at the base of it. Is oh, that true? Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Is that like I got a, a shrug. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I think because I've listened to Jeremy Horowitz in my ear enough on times. Well, if Jeremy said it, I would trust it. Okay, so just FYI, maybe <laughs> zoom in on the base a little bit. <laughs> you can uh, come down five if you want. You know, deep sea science is such a team effort. We it, so many different phyla, so many different taxonomies living hey together. So much technology um, that? required to get here that none of us can be I, an expert uh, in any certain on, I can't aspect or um, more. So it's really kind of a jack of all trades, master of none, or master of one very specific things with a broad breadth and other things. Um, yeah. So you almost never see a scientific literature paper published on deep sea without n you know, anywhere from four or five to dozens of authors that contributed to it, because uh, it's so complicated to integrate all the different data types, all the different technologies, and all the different taxonomies required to understand these ecosystems. It's a huge team effort, you know, and that's why there's so many scientists ashore and you can only have so many people on a ship and so many eyeballs on a camera. Mm -hmm. That's why, with the help of telepresence. <laughs> the magic of telepresence, <laughs> the magic excuse of te you. Yeah, the magic of telepresence. Teed that right up there for you. <laughs> we were laughing earlier, that would be like the free square in everybody's bingo card. Yeah. <laughs> Tuning in. Yeah. <laughs> but I am really glad that y'all were talking about that because that's something that 
uh, I try to relate to students all the time is when you watch a nature documentary, it focuses on in on that one science or scientist, and it makes it seem like it's this person saving the entire deep sea community. And really, it is truly a team effort. And in order for you to be build successful career skills and for you to get hired, so much of it does come down to can you work together with others? Can you be a team member? And that's that's a hard skill to learn, and that's a hard skill to teach. It is. Um, but, yeah, you kind of need it in every... Every even job. Before, yeah, even before I got to grad school, which needs a lot of, <laughs> a lot of team <laughs> effort. Um, even before I got to grad school, it, it, just in my job in industry, uh, yeah, you needed to be able to work with other people. <laughs> So Deb, going back to your comment about the black corals, uh, somebody just typed in that the most important taxonomic information for IDing black corals are the spines located at the base of the branches mm -hmm. and lower down on the stalks, but that's not something that can typically be seen from a camera view. Mm -hmm. Bam. Hmm. So it seems like the waves are starting to calm down. Is that what y'all are noticing up, up front? Uh, or is it still just as bad? I can tell you right here, actually. You also have the technology. If you go to uh, <laughs> the graphonographs for ROV Pilot Less. Oh, I'm looking at it right back here. And at the very bottom, there's uh, what I call the barfo barfometer. Is that the second graph or the last one? Uh, the very one at the bottom that says A-frame vertical velocity. Got it. So that's a graph of the uh, acceleration of the A-frame. And you can play around with the uh, time there. I have mine set for the last 15 minutes because I'm mm -hmm. also tracking our depth here. <laughs> but if you set it for like the last hour or two, you can get more of a trend or if you put it to the last minute you can actually see what's happening every there's also the update rate there the very slow one second update rate but uh yeah it does seem like it's flattening out a little bit at least for the moment so one of the one of the many challenges of working this far offshore out here in sure. part is the weather forecasts are pretty bad. Um, you know, if you think about all the different weather stations you have on land, every airport, people who have report weather monitors in their backyards and everything, we're lucky if we got a weather station on a buoy within 500 miles of us. <laughs> um, there's one on, you know, the tower ray out here, um, which m monitors the Pacific and kind of is an early warning system for some of the El Nino signs. Um, and then a couple of the islands and then ships that take the time to report their weather observations. And that's it. <coughs> and we're talking a density of weather observations out here, many orders of magnitude less than what you get on land. And you can really tell it in the forecast um, how much less accurate the forecast out here is this far away yep. from major shipping lanes and stuff like that. Um, even as ocean goes, the forecast is worse in this part of the world. Often it's even hard to find a weather map that covers this part of the Pacific. Um, you're kind of looking at the edges of two different weather maps kind of pasted together to see our operation area because um, no one's out here. So from an ROV diving point of view, what's kind of the max wave height that you can safely dive with the ROVs? That is, uh, it depends. It wildly depends on the uh, vessel the ROV, the launch and recovery system. Um, for Hercules and Atalanta, it's um, it's basically a couple meters. We're uh, typically on the edge of our our weather envelope out here, two and a half meters maybe. Okay.
But if you have a uh, fancy boat like Falcor 2, you know, that's a much bigger, more stable platform. They have a oh, sea cucumber. built-in dedicated A-frame and uh, actively heave compensated winch. Uh, but still, you have to, you know, get it through the air interface to the water. So the Falcor 2 can get away with a little bit more, but wasn't the Falcor 2, I'm, that's I'm relatively I'm speculating. New. I haven't actually sailed on the Falcor 2 yet, so. But I've sailed on similar uh, vessels. <coughs> and, uh, yeah, our weather window's easily twice what it is here on Nautilus, four gotcha. to six meters. Nice little purple holothorian here. Zoom in a bit there if you want. I think this is one of my favorite deep sea colors. Yeah. That deep purple. Mm. I'm more of a Victor Gorgia purple person you myself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <me> too. Too. <laughs> but they're also very similar purples. Uh, push, it is similar. Push right in a little bit. Over here. Yeah, beautiful. Maybe Ooh. open the iris just a touch. So you can actually see here it's semi-translucent. So that kind of tube thing you're seeing in the middle of its body is its digestive tract. So that is the sand that it is um, processing as it moves through its digestive tract. Does it have a stomach? Y yes. Um, a classical definition of a stomach versus just a really, really long intestine, I'm not sure I would say one way or the other, but it has a, it has a dual-ended um, digestive tract and exactly the different parts I would not go on record saying what they are because I don't know but it is got a relatively n normal by human standards vertebrate standards type digestive tract mm -hmm. what is strange about them is they actually breathe out of their anus so their gill um, structures are on their anus end of the digestive tract sounds difficult isn't that one of the same things about a sea turtle it can kind of do something similar no, I have no not idea. that I'm aware of. Somebody told me but a fun fact about that, and I was like, I have, okay. Wow, it's remnants of its okay, dinner. Okay, you can uh, go cool. wide while mosey on. It's an interesting, uh, interesting box you're getting yourself into there, and <laughs> The walls of death are closing in. It's an escape room. Think of it like an escape room. How are you going to get out? <laughs> So we have a geology question. Um, what I'm going to uh, um, I'm going to run across to the other side, I think. So what are the coolest minerals that we might right find right. down here? Down here. <laughs> or we can make it more um, broad-ended for you in general. What are some of the cool minerals? Okay. So down here on the fair manganese crust, uh, we don't really talk about things in terms of minerals, but a very common one would be veranodite. Uh, there's also like a delta manganese oxide, that mineral that we talk about. These are all just variations of uh, manganese or iron oxides, all of the minerals uh, names in the fair manganese crust. Uh -huh. In the um, volcanic rock, underneath the crust. I pulling you? Uh, uh, come down. I know uh, some scientists ashore use uh, different different minerals to date, which is why we're looking for some particular rocks to date, so you can pull. use hornblende uh, to do that. When you can, Dan, can take uh, a look at any of these kind of thinner corals um, that you can see around here. Right so it. those are pretty cool. Um, and then yeah, you can come right down. You got other types of minerals that would be fun to see. Mm -hmm. If you're kind of close to hydrothermal vents, you could s like some seafloor massive sulfides is a, another type of hydrogenetic rock, means it's formed from the right. water. Um, you those, uh, five if you, want. you could see like pyrite or which is your favorite. Yeah, my favorite, some of pyrite minerals in there. I think is cool. Any uh, particular ones you want to look at here, Brian? Uh, either a 
So many choices. This one or this one. All right. So that's a, a Chrysogorgia on kind of the side, and I'm pretty sure these are bamboos on top, but I just want to confirm that they are bamboo and get a better look for when we uh, get the bamboo taxonomist to ID these for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're 23 meters off the deck, so you're good. Mm. And we're getting stretched out, so you can actually come down another five, four. Yep, this is a bamboo. Also has some dead branches again. This is just not not good place for bamboo corals to live, despite them being relatively common. None of them appear to be thriving. All right, science is happy with that shot. Thank you. All right, and on a previous note, uh, thanks to Dr. Google, uh, turtles can breathe from their cloaca. That so is news to me. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, <laughs> I'm gonna come down to the sand here and then turn and burn to the west and get back in front of me. Really nice shot in uh, Atalanta's view of this little sand channel. We're gonna be entering here. You can uh, bring your head to the left a little bit and it'll light it up nicely. Come down a couple more meters if you want. We haven't gone negative delta yet, but you can come right down. So I'm watching your altitude there, right? You're good. And I'm and we're stretched out, so we're far enough away. And since I'm moving the tethers nicely managed, so I can go for the beauty shot there. That's a beautiful bed form. For yeah. <clears throat> One of those interesting things about the kind of the microbial and biogeochemical research in deep sea sediments or sediments in general, submarine, people kind of used to, researchers used to ignore the sand thinking that there wasn't as much active microbial processes doing biogeochemical things like fixing nitrogen or denitrifying and all those kind of Shot you know, things that are very, very extremely critical for marine ecosystems and life. Um, they thought most of that happened in the mud. Mm -hmm. And now they're beginning to realize that a lot, a lot of it happens in the sand and it actually happens so quick because there's so much of it going on in the sand that it's really hard to sample. And so it was less of, it was more of a sampling bias where the sampling techniques they were using to try and understand these processes worked better in the mud than the sand, and so they were missing a lot of what was going on in deep sea sediment and marine sediment in general. Uh, and they're having to go back and kind of look more at sand and understand its role versus mud, um, which sounds maybe okay. a little boring Can sometimes. You, uh, but when you think about <laughs> turning turn right up the hill for me, that geo, you know, to global scale processes that control and regulate nutrients and climate things by fixing carbon and denitrifying things and changing ammonia into nitrate, um, which are all uh, things that make life uh, functional in marine ecosystems. I'll come closer to you a little before I come up the hill. If we could, could we try to sample a rock around here? Sure. You want to come all stop on the uh, on Maybe, ship? I don't know if these... Right. I should know that. I should know that. I have or that information. Maybe this one looks angular. They what all look angular. Cantaloupe-sized. <laughs> the the standard instrument or the SI notation of cantaloupe-sized. <laughs> cantaloupe-sized. It's a cantaloupe, but sharp and edges. One angular cantaloupe, not to be confused with one Europe European swallow. <laughs> um, sorry, I missed which one you circled. Oh. This one, but it looks kind of big. I don't know. Is that right? That's watermelon size, not cantaloupe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe one's up here. If that's possible. Uh, that's not too big. Let's see the lasers on it there. It Depends. might be stuck in place, though. The more yeah, they look we won't. At it. We won't know until I uh, yeah. sit down and poke around. Poke there. around.
Yeah, we're gonna come up a rather steep hill there, but we've been stopped for a while, so it shouldn't get too close. I'm just gonna uh, poke my nose into the hill here and uh, did I fly over it? Sorry, I lost the plot. Where was it? Uh, it was down below, but maybe these other one, like maybe one of yeah, these. Yeah, that one looks good. Yeah, yeah. All right. Might be good. We're gonna do a probably not too elegant landing here, and it's a lot of silt, so. Aziz late. Favorite line from my favorite movie. What movie is that? I don't recognize it. Totally dating myself. <laughs> uh, the Fifth Element. Oh, that's a great movie. Cult classic. Bruce Willis. Totally. Mia Djokovic, I think is how you say it. Yeah. Chris Rock at his finest. I enjoyed that mm. movie. That right? one's that's loose. a cult classic. Ooh, that, that one moved. Uh, yeah, that oh, one's loose. Oh. What was the other one you were looking at? Is this one loose? Uh, I don't know. Yep. Ooh. Success. That looks pretty angular to me. Oh, but it, it is a cantaloupe shape. <laughs> or cantaloupe size. Looks about it. Oh, the one behind its list, they're all loose. Oh, huh. Uh, you want to give us a zoom there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're going to need to winch up. Dan, yeah. can you move it out in the light pool just a little bit better? So uh, sorry. Go. Uh, up to tilt up here. I'm tucked into the hill. Oh wait, I have a pen and tilt light now. Okay, I think we uh, can. Cool. Could you give it a turn for me, please? Yeah, he's getting the light on hill. Okay. Trying to. So. Uh, <coughs> Can't go out much further there. <laughs> you okay with that, Corley? Yeah, I All think right. this one's good. Let's take it. Let's bring it up to the ship. Ready to that. I'm just going to uh, fly around with it for a minute here. Sounds good. Okay, there you can go wide, please. Avoid that and cringing wall of redness on the sonar. Yeah, it's getting a little close. There it should be. Yeah, yeah, we need to, we need to come up. Where am I? Behind you. Right there. Come on, manipulator. So Corley, what is it about that angular rock sample that makes you just want to grab it? <laughs> well, it's it's not for me. Um, when it's I'm not looking for your personal rock collection. No, it's not. Um, when I'm looking for rocks, I'm actually looking for the opposite of uh, angular. I'm looking I? for really my grounded um, rocks because that kind of proves to me that they're uh, more I'll crusty. Uh, so up the, hill here a bit. the angular rocks. Uh, kind of more signify that it's more volcanic rock underneath uh, than maybe a thin know. layer of ferromanganese crust coating. Uh, but if you have really rounded rocks, um, you most likely have a very thick ferromanganese crust coating because it's been accumulating over millions of years. So the angular rock is because we are trying to date different, um, different seamounts in the area. Uh, the the geology and the geochronology of the line islands, yeah, which right is there, we're just swinging uh, in a bit. this so general region of seamounts that we're in, is very 
poorly constrained. 20 meters. Um, so we're trying to get some rocks that we can date, and then we have some scientists ashore um, who are going to help us with that. So Amber Siravolo, uh, I went on a cruise with her last slow, year. Right? She was working on some rocks that we collected last cruise. Um, but hopefully we can bring her back some new ones. And I do have to make an apology. It was not Chris Rock from The Fifth Element. It was Chris Tucker. My apologies. Sorry to all the Chris uh, Tucker stands. I wanted to oh, that's put in. We came around the wrong way. Uh, we came around the wrong way there, so <laughs> can you... Uh, come up and make the Delta 20 something. Always love the shape of these pillow basalts. I'm thinking, you know, imagining what it must have looked like when they were forming and they were draping down and blowing out and everything. I'm going to quite the show play with your head in here, so. Yeah, I think we all <laughs> we all wonder <laughs> what they look like because I think 70% of the Earth's volcanism happens underneath the water, and we know where all of these underwater volcanoes are, and yet we have yet to have any footage of something being erupted. <laughs> one, one footage, one footage of something being erupted. So. So would you have rather been a pterodactyl or a mosasaur to see this volcano erupt way back in the day? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I hope the paleontologists don't come at me. <laughs> Carly, you don't know your dinosaurs, and you're out. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, you're voted okay, out I'm going to turn band. your, uh, <laughs> what is it, the aft ground vaulting thruster back off. That should be a good heading there. So I'll just, uh, if you hold that heading, I'll get out in front of you now that we're going up the hill. So let me throw that question over to Deb. Yeah. Would you have rather watched these, <laughs> these pillow basalts being formed as a mosasaur? Or as a pterodactyl. So I know what a pterodactyl is. Me. I'm not sure I know what a mosasaur is. Yeah, that that's where I'm getting water. stuck. Y'all need to watch Jurassic World. Well, I have I seen have. that, but I don't... Like the giant no. mosasaur. Oh, it's like yeah, the alligator awesome. thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you jump up and eat everybody. Yeah. It's a good heading there. I'll, I'll I think the question is, you. would you rather be in the sky or Thank underwater? Mm -hmm. Which I was kind of getting that you were alluding to. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that... It's uh, yeah, I just turned a thruster on for a heartbeat to take that turn out of each other. I think I'd rather be an organism that could transcend both of them. Yeah. <laughs> because you want to see, like, what's happening at the surface. But like Corley said, we don't have a lot of underwater view of we are, an erupting uh, officially back in the box. Species. I mean, we do have some, but, you know, Almost. I think, I'm I think still under. I'll get out heady. I'm, I'm like, you know, one of those people start. that want to... Oh, then we'll put our to. rock away and then uh, we'll start moving the boat again. So you want to be, like... I spun... Atlanta a diving clockwise. pelican, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> to take, you want to be uh, like a, a We had two turns in the 6-8 and uh, <laughs> turn like in a turn and a half in the dinosaur other. Dinosaur version. Dinosaur so version of a cormorant. So we brought Atlanta up so it was tight, so the tubby's not all floppy <laughs> under there. Eight fish. And uh, we did a quick spinner. With spin. your eyes open while the volcano was erupting. So if you're doing that, you want to have your, you know, your tether stretched out. Otherwise, it looks like a... It's also the same length. Or it's the same estimated cord. length as a megalodon. Mm. Somewhere around 59 feet. A uh, whole big grouping of them. So like there was so many different mosasaurs. Oh. Uh, oh, but, oh, okay, sorry. Most of them can't compete with megalodon, but the largest remains of one was 59 feet. Which is the estimated length for a megalodon. God, that's so big. I think we're getting in Pacific Rim territory here, so <laughs> I think we should just go, go back to the science. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, there's some beautiful coral. Exactly.
And there's a little associate with it. I do love that terminology, an associate. Like, it just makes me think of, like, the yeah. corals, bamboo PR cor person. Yeah, bamboo Coming corals and associates. <laughs> like a law firm. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, um, can you change the um, camera to the uh, starboard bio box and then open that box up? So yeah, we're looking at what, probably a bamboo coral with that anemone. And then we've got another bottle brush Chrysogorgia here. Um, and the pilots are okay. just putting, or open have gotten the, uh, back into happy open formation the box. and are stowing our rock from a few minutes ago. Well, thank you for that, Brian. I didn't you can I uh, zoom in there if you want. There are while we're putting a rock in the box. Right. Uh, the one behind where I put the last sample, I think, should be open, right? Uh, Roger. it and change the camera back. Uh, sorry, we're floating away in there. It's really steep. We don't have enough beams for our Doppler to uh, hold the vehicle. So that's an Another right one of those interesting nuances about, or that uh, people just watching at home don't normally see, is all the different sonars that are at play here. Um, we've got two different forward-looking sonars off each vehicle. We've got a Doppler velocity log um, helping with the navigation and tracking the bottom, downward-looking off Hercules, and then both vehicles have ultra-short baseline okay, uh, tracking okay. de tracking systems um, ready. that communicate Thank with you. the ship so we can see where they are. So there's a whole bunch of different frequencies of sonar all running off different instruments um, to help us navigate and track um, the vehicles. So we have a question online, and this is kind of something that we were talking to, not last night, but at like 4.30 this morning. Uh, how does the phenomenon like El Nino and La Nina affect these deep sea ecosystems? biggest thing that I am kind of aware of or think of is, is food supply. Um, the shifting of the Tilt cold bit, and horse. hot water masses in the surface waters have a pretty dramatic effect on where uh, a lot of primary productivity, especially in the central and eastern Pacific, occur. And so I don't know off the top of my head where that, you know, from one spot there it shifts to another, but I know there would be shifts. and. That could certainly in, in cr create food pulses or lack of food influence in the deep sea in certain regions. There's other, you know, current flow and things like that adjust, which if it, the whole ocean is pretty much connected. So if you have, you know, a weakening of trade winds, you would have a weakening of equatorial upwelling and things like that, that in some of, it would certainly affect some of the shallower equatorial seamounts as well. Thank you. You can come up just a bit if that tether's smacking you. It's right under your camera at the moment. So if you look at the Atlanta, Atlanta feed, um, you can get a sense of how much the ship is pitching. Uh, all mm. of that motion up and down where you see the tether moving several meters uh, up and down in the camera feed is, is a direct um, connection to how much the aft end of Nautilus is pitching up and down as we ride through uh, a stiff trade winds. Right. 
Commander. All right, Dan, are you ready to take requests? Oh, yeah, always right. ready. Well, can we do the one in the top left, please? Roger. Okay, Daryl, pushing a bit there for us. Corley, what was the name of the geological feature that's this little beveled, bumpy edge? Botryoidal. Botryoidal. Te texture, yes. All right. Thank you. Another fun geology term um, that no one asked for, but I'm going to say it anyways. Uh, you have a lot of um, I'm pushing geology a bit more if you want. folks online. <laughs> Great. So a lot of people don't actually get to work with ferromanganese crust, I found out. Even people who are on papers with ferromanganese crust have never actually seen them in person. So that's pretty cool that I get to work with them. Right, I think One thing that surprises good. a lot of people is you that... Good? We got zoom left. So. I think give me a little more if you would. Yeah, go ahead, Daryl. Sorry, Corner. No, no, no. Uh, is in. that while these look pretty intact, these crusts are actually very crumbly, but the word we would use is friable. Fry? Friable. <laughs> okay, you can go away. Yeah, so it's something that I is kind of been the bane of my existence through my graduate career is that we I'm like really interested in the top surface of the of the rock because we want to pair it we believe that that's the currently growing face of the rock mm -hmm. um, and then we have all of this current water property data that we get from all the sensors on Herc so we want to pair those two things together but because the rock is so friable there's a lot of stuff that I have to be really careful with. Like I can't cut the rocks open because a whole chunk will fall off. You can't knock them. Mm -hmm. Shipping them is kind of an issue. So the past couple of times I've come out on Nautilus, I do all the top scraping and everything as soon as we get the rocks Whoa. to prevent any sort of bumping or chipping that might happen. Yeah, it's always funny when you pack a couple hundred kilos of rocks together and then stick <laughs> fragile all over it. <laughs> I think last year we got, during the expedition season, we had 800 and some odd pounds of rocks. Good Lord. Yeah, I vaguely remember someone telling me that. Real quick, what is that in oh. that top center? Is that a weird rock? It's dead sponge, no, that's, I'm yeah, sure. some Hopefully a sign of things to come above us. Yep. So what is that again? It's a dead sponge of some type. Oh, oh, okay, like a basket <laughs> sponge. Uh, no, so that's its stalk coming up the top. So it's more of a stalk sponge that has fallen over and fallen downhill. That thing is massive. That's a good size one, yeah. Whoa, I'm blown away by that. There so looked like there was a bamboo stalk a, ways, a little ways back that was quite large that was dead and old. So it yeah. almost seems like... Optimistic we might be moving into some... Yeah. Some good coral gardens here. So we've got what looks like it's probably a bamboo, Chrysogorgia, several bamboos, several Chrysogorgias. Um, we haven't seen a lot of whips. Can, Dan, can we go check out this whip back here? Sure. Coming around the little outcrop here, maybe we'll... A few sponges up above us, maybe. Can you look right just a little bit for me? Uh, this whip here, Brent? Yes, please. So this is probably the highest diversity little cluster we've seen so far here. Um. All right, that's definitely some type of bamboo there. You can uh, push in there. Yep. It's hard to see the bands in there, but I'm pretty sure they're there, big, fleshy, 
polyps, and I can see it. Some hints of ban hints yeah, of banding in there. You can push in a bit more if you want. Get a polyp zoom there. Ooh, oh, pretty shot. Um, before we get too far, since I know you got a ship move in, can we trip a Niskin here? Sure. And before you move the camp, if we can zoom out and kind of get a shot of the whole area uh, so we can ID Under. all the corals you together uh, and get a sense of their area. For go go wide for us. Yeah, and Chris, if you'll take a sample in situ shot of this right here, it'll help them in IDing what all they expect to see in this water sample. Got it. All right. We're good back here, Dan. Thanks. If you can just pull whatever Niskin you want. Under. Six has already been fired, I believe. Yes, six is pulled. Yes, it has. Yeah. Turn on the pen and tilt light for me. And this is going to be what sample number? Uh, sample 015. Okay. Yeah, watch out for that manipulator. I tried to put the impossible sticker that came off of a laser on the manipulator and it didn't stay there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's five popped. All right. So this can okay, five can is sample off. zero one five. And we've got a, a, a medium density, high diversity, biodiversity uh, spot for this. Couple potential forea sponges, uh, several bamboos, couple chrysogorgids, maybe a primnoid, all on this one little uh, promontory. Pen left is also kind of slow. You can put a note in the. <coughs> Takes forever to get to a Niskin. Fine, are they kind of greenish brown stock sponges? I believe they are dead sponges. Yeah. They okay. could be still alive with just a sediment coat, but given kind of how light the sediment drape is here, I guess is they're dead. It's that one just off to the right is interesting because it, it's almost like it's got the same sort of like coral fingers to it. Yep. I think up there in the back might be a live one. Yeah, I can see it up there in uh, Atalanta. Yeah, can we uh, exit that way? Absolutely. So as we're exiting, we're getting a, a couple of questions about the geology of the area. And one of them is, it looks like there's some fuzzy material on rocks. Is it organic? Is it sand? Is it bacteria? Um, okay, well, the fuzzy material, I'm going to guess, is probably some sort of organic something. If it's fibrous, which is the only thing that I could imagine would be kind of fibrous down here looking at Brian but yeah so if if it's if it's fibrous and got structure it's probably biological um, the clay minerals you see down here have got a charge right so you get some flocculent generation if you've got fine clay -y things that you might see I would imagine um, I love that word and flocculent then you can get just sediment drape too uh, and then you get a combination of some biofilming with the sediment mixing in. Um. Push in just a little there, Daryl. Right. Okay. That should be good enough for an ID from our point of view. Push in a little more for the beauty shot there. This will be on the overnight uh, package of images to Chris Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Who thinks he retired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so I'm not 100 Kay. sure what those little purple dots are. Go, uh, go for full zoom there. 
Ooh. Well, they are beautiful. anemones. Oh. Sorry, I thought so it was tiny. stable. Yep, so every one of those little purple dots is an associate commensal anemone, it looks like to me. Mm. It could be hydrozoans too, but I'm going to go with an anemone for now. Sorry, I didn't hear you. This would make a cool fabric. No, I think we're good. Perfect for the summertime. Yeah. Science is happy when you're done with the pretty beauty <laughs> shot. <laughs> Roger. <coughs> okay, it can go away. Seems more sweater like. <laughs> Available now on Etsy.com. <laughs> Ocean inspired clothing. I definitely have a fair amount of those from a couple of different websites mm -hmm. and I love them all. Ocean themed clothing? Yes. I even have a pair of uh, Converse shoes that look like a coral reef. Oh, that's fun. The best pair of sci ocean science inspired clothing pants I've ever seen was uh, bring uh, your head to a the colleague right a who me. did um, whale acoustics did and with a lot and a lot of work with e EK-60 split beam fishery sonars actually got a sonogram of an EK-60 printed on leggings. Mm -hmm. Okay, I gotta come, uh, I'm going the wrong and way the here. And <laughs> socks, <laughs> they were handing them out at Oceans. <laughs> Megan Putz, who uh, has come on as a scientist as a, and a navigator on Nautilus, always wears ocean-themed leggings. Yeah. And you can always tell it's Friday, because every Friday she wears her octopus leggings. <laughs> octopus Fridays. Hmm. I know Samantha has a pair of googly eye squid leggings. Oh, fun. And it was, it's so cute. I do not have any ocean themed clothes, so wow. if Ooh. you want to go to my Amazon storefront, if no one <laughs> purchase that for me. <laughs> nice little collection of corals here, all things I'm pretty sure we've seen and gotten a good image of so far. Coming down the hill here to another little flat spot. So this is a great example of the limitations even of our super high resolution bathymetry though. And we've got one of the most technologically um, advanced sonar systems for this type of water depth out here. It's half a generation behind the true cutting edge, but it's really, really good. Um, com and we're going up and down these little hills that are totally invisible on our um, sonar. We're seeing this is should be a fairly steady um, increase up. Um, instead, we're finding this uh, kind of hilly terrain, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's you know the amazing thing is how much better the hull-mounted advanced sonars we have on this ship are better than the satellite altimetry or the single beam sonars we used to work with. Um, but when you think about how much better they could be to get sub-meter or centimeter level accuracy maps like we are used to on land. We got a long way to go in the ocean still. And those, uh, I think those are nodules or? I don't know, poke them. do that. But that's a core of the question, I don't. Some of them may be individual. They kind of just look, I feel like nodules would be a little bit more round than these are. Yeah. Oh, they're solid. Yeah, that's crust. Total crust. Hmm. Oh, and a sea cucumber. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was uh, what I call freeze fail there. <laughs> Remember we talked thing. about that? I said I, <laughs> not if, but when. So I. I didn't stop to make sure the manipulator was <coughs> not alive. So I think we must have a sponge expert listening to Nautilus Live. They have identified the past one or two sponges that we've seen. Excellent. It's always nice to have help from the beach. Yeah. 
We appreciate your contributions. 100%. And your uh, altitude's going to rapidly get down to the uh, lower teens there. You're going to have to come up. I'll Those rocks kind of look something from like Dr. Seuss's imagination, how they're all lumpy. Yeah, lumpy, almost fuzzy looking, weird shapes. Another stalked crinoid. Looks like it flattens out there a little bit. Should be okay. Maybe come up just so you're in the teens there. Stocked crinoid here. So, the next question as we're moving up and looking at these crinoids is are they all facing the same direction? Hmm. Another little Chrysogorgia here. So far, the last four crinoids have all been facing more or less uphill. Oh, this one's just facing straight up. Broke the trend. All right. Ooh, got a couple little, little right. grouping here. What do we have? And a nice, probably Calophacus sponge over here. Couple bamboos on the left. Probably another couple bamboos on the right. Can we just take a couple snap zooms on these things. Sorry, what do you want? What do you want to see, Brian? Uh, if oh, you want to just kind of do this cluster right here, just a floating zoom, and then, or if we're moving over here, we can do this one first. Yep, we can do the downhill one here. Sure. And we don't need don't need pretty shots, just need a half frame tight to confirm the ID. Go ahead. Daryl, go ahead. <coughs> That's good. Right. That's good enough for me. I'll take a look at the uh, sponge on the way out here. Yes, please. Uh, push in on the sponge a bit there if you want. Challenging for Iris. Okay. We'll uh, <coughs> go wide there and we'll uh, where were the ones on the left right here? The yellow, are those are also crinoids? Yep, okay. I believe the yellow the yellow is crinoids. Yeah, behind your ways. And then uh, that stock is just 
can that's come down stopped. a couple yep. meters. That's yeah. Potentially, uh, I'm not sure did what, but <coughs> all right, I'm good, Dan. If you want to catch up, Roger. Thank you. talking about <laughs> 400 where are you getting that number I don't know what that number is click your auto heading on and off that goes wonky once in a while yeah now I'm going south so Yeah, it might be Hercules. <laughs> Sorry. It's following my nose here. I'm going to have to turn and come towards you. But I want to go this way. Why is that so dark? Is that just the shadow, the way the light's hitting? So one of the things that stands out here is the crinoids, the cometulid crinoids, or the, the feather stars we're seeing here, are all on the ground, mm -hmm. as opposed to earlier in the dive. Uh, you can they're all on. Um, uh, let it come around. All up I'll come on the corals. Mm. So the question right. is: Is there something different here in the hydrodynamics, or something about these rocks that it, they're more advantageous being lower to the ground, whereas they were finding more food or something higher up? I was going to say that one seemed like a smooth surface, but then I saw that granite up there and it sounded a <laughs> bumpy surface. So there went that one theory. I was going to say, thank God we have a great map that allows <laughs> us to stop. really see the contours of everything. They're picking on me because I no, no, bring up I'm the mouse. <laughs> you just showed us this whole map. Uh, it was mm, beautiful. Come and down it a couple so meters there. I was more curious about your comment about the black rock. We're going to have to go tail to tail here. I'm going to pull you just Ooh, to uh, get the next little lump here, and then I'll come back to the north. It's a sponge with a ton of crinoids, yeah? yeah. You can uh, double click your auto heading. And definitely going to be tail to tail here. <coughs> So here we've got all the crinoids that have climbed up on um, the sponge. That's yeah. so crazy. He doesn't look, or that sponge doesn't look too happy. <coughs> yeah, it looks like it's got some fairly significant patches of either sick or dead okay. tissue. You want a closer mm. shot of the sponge, Brian? No, I, I think that's probably good enough, and I know you're pulled out. Yeah, I am. It's also one nice thing about Atlantic and drag it all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Argus resists a little more, but it um, makes it really difficult to change my heading. Can we go this way for a while? I mean, I'm fine with it if we want to. We can follow our nose for a bit. Uh, I don't know if the ship can do it. I don't know. Oh, where are you? You can try. Uh, no, I, I don't think they're going to want to go that way. <laughs> no. These look like bigger coral communities than we've seen. Yeah, I agree. Okay. And there's our first sea star yeah. out there in the bit out there in the blue. Oh yeah, I can. Starfish. Okay, what well, makes a sea star Starfish. different than a, a brittle star or a? <laughs> I'm is it pulling a really hard star? on you. Now. Yeah. So, <laughs> sea stars are uh, asteroidia. Um, and they, the big difference you can tell them apart is the central disk of a brittle star, Ophiroid, is really a defined circle with kind of Just double click it. very clear arms where the central disk star stops and the arms start. Um, the asteroids are, are kind of 
sea stars have what you're looking Push at here, there, where the body there. just kind of blends into the, the star arms. And, then I gotta okay. go. um, and this is where we put our, our bat star up in the sky and ask Chris Modicon and tell us what we're looking at. <laughs> okay, but there was it can one go on that coral. <laughs> It's, uh, right corner. it's getting ugly there because I'm so tight where yep. you're seeing the uh, ship motion in the video. Come down a couple more meters. Come down three meters. Fish. And we've got a rat tail here as we fly through a macaroid. Ooh, that's our first fish we've seen since the beginning of this shift. You can tell the rat tails apart from the Ophidiids or Cuskeels because of that one really pronounced fin right just back on their head. Whereas the Cuskeels kind of taper into this long pectoral-esque fin that runs right into their caudal fin. I'm sure some ichthyologist is going to tell me I butchered which fin was which. <laughs> Okay, I'm coming Terrain at you changed now. So, so completely. Mm. Uh, you can hold the 300 heading and I'll fly back underneath you. And same game as before. As I get closer, you'll come up a bit. We're still 15 meters away. So there's, there's a bamboo coral here, and it's a little bit deceptive, and it kind of looks like it might be living in the in the sediment, but it's actually on this crust that's kind of lightly dripped, draped with sediment. So it's it's holding onto that rock, and the sediment is probably moving on and off of this rock, um, depending on wind currents kind of roll through and flush um, or blow off this thin sediment veil. One of the things that we're really just kind of beginning to research in the deep sea is the effect of um, internal waves breaking on these seamounts. So anytime you have uh, a density change, a picnocline, um, you can have a wave. So just like in the surface of the water and the ocean where you've got a density change between the, the somewhat fluid behaving gas and the fluid of water, you see waves. Um, the same thing can happen if you have a more dense water layer sitting on a, or sitting a less dense water layer sitting on a more dense water layer, mm -hmm. you can get waves there. And these can happen at multiple depths uh, and can be really quite huge. Um, and so one of the things that we think happens, we know happens on seamounts, is seamounts can punch through these density layers or the density layers interact with the seafloor on the side of the seamounts and you can have these waves breaking and causing flow and ripples and just like would occur on a beach, um, have breaking waves moving up and down the sides of these seamounts at anywhere from you know tidal dr driven daily cycles to much more complicated oceanographic processes resulting in bigger waves less often. Um, and the what impact that has on resuspending sediment, moving water, moving things around that could impact uh, coral life, we don't really know yet. Um, some You're going to want to come clockwise. Take some your studies turn have out. definitely and shown that it in, you know, in there, changes Darryl? the benthic water conditions, but how that causes um, the life to change is still very much a, a matter of open research. Cool what? little urchin I like of this some little guy. You can see his, Yeah, you can see his little <laughs> snail trail behind him. Oh. How old do you think that urchin is? I don't, wouldn't even know where to start. <laughs> According to an old Japanese boy I work with, uh, he says they're hundreds of years old. Wow. It could have been lost in translation, though. Well, that that age range is not is pretty common in the deep sea, so I wouldn't 
certainly wouldn't automatically discount it. It's, but I don't have I have no no knowledge of the lifespans of urchins in the deep sea. I know there was a big thread on Reddit yesterday. You know, talk, the amazing Reddit. It was t um, talking about all what the Greenland sharks being so old, which we already all knew, but it was trending yesterday. What's uh, my friend, Allison. Hi, Allison. I hope studying for uh, medical school, or no, what is it? Step one is going well. <laughs> have you ever seen a giant yeah. squid? So I have this not. This is a, a giant barnacle. At the <laughs> she said, answer my question. <laughs> Wait, you hope not? You don't want to see a giant squid? No, I have not. You can, uh, oh. but you can I would push love right to in there. I mean, isn't that if you want? like everyone's life goal to see a giant squid? Yes. Oh, is that a snail? That's a barnacle. Oh. Barnacle. Oh, barnacle. It's a barnacle growing off the base of a Chrysogorgia, and then we've got a squat lobster living up in the in the coral itself. Oh yeah, right there at the top. What? Yep. Oh, now Perfect. I see them. Yeah, they blend right in. Yeah, I see that little claw waving to us. Another <laughs> another one. Hi, of those buddy. Great questions about color in the deep sea is, mm. in a completely dark environment, why would you need to be color camouflaged with your host? That uh, full zoom is it there? So we don't get it, or so they don't get eaten. But if it's totally dark, why does it matter? That's full zoom. Right. right. Sir, so I'm I'm happy oh, to oh I see people it. Okay, coming yeah. along. <laughs> okay, you can go away. Right <laughs> All these nosy submersibles and <laughs> ROVs. For the one moment in time when the flashlight is going to beam on them. <laughs> So a few minutes ago, we were talking about how it's common to see creatures that are extremely long lived in the deep sea. Why is that? Is it slower metabolic rate? Is it the colder temperatures are better for preserving tissue? What's the theory behind that? D, all of the above. Mm, that'll work, all right. <laughs> and then is there a certain way that we research that? Uh, like, are there trackers on deep sea animals, or is it just when they pass, we take their otoliths, or? Yeah, so it is, for fish, it, it is, Come if they have it. an otolith, um, Come up, five. we uh, we look at pink. Yeah, otolith. right. Um, yeah, for Pushing fish, if there. they have otoliths, you can age their otoliths, which are their, their ear bones, basically. Um, for corals, we generally do some type of radiometric dating of the skeleton. Um, I believe the oldest okay. Okay. coral has been dated to 4,400 years old in the Hawaiian Islands. Mm -hmm. I use that fact to almost every interaction. This is some type of right. bamboo with a spiny armed um, ophiocanthid uh, brittle star. That should be good enough for an ID, thank you. Okay, moving on. What's that? Hmm. So my first job out of undergraduate, uh, I was working on charter boats and um, fisheries management, but in the winter time when nobody yeah. wants to go fishing. I'm gonna come by here and you can turn clockwise, should take it out we would get, we would trade otolith samples. So Florida would send us their otolith, Texas would send Florida theirs. And I remember counting a- um, Push in there, Daryl. What is it, the deep sea red bream. Let's see if anybody's and home. It, oh my gosh. You would count one of the otoliths and then you would need to take a five minute break because your eyes would just go cross-eyed. Hmm. Another pretty hexactinod sponge here. We haven't seen this one yet, I don't believe, today. And often they have associates living down inside of these, sometimes even inside of them. You'll see just shadows climbing around inside the different parts of the sponge with different arthropods and stuff like that. Yeah, I see it. I think Megan Potts told us that in like some cultures, it's like before marriage or something, you would give a dead sea sponge that would have two like lobsters living in it. And shrimp. It was shrimp. shrimp, that's what it was. Yep. <laughs> All right, science is happy here, thank Roger. you. 
Okay, you can go away. Yeah, so the, the you, there's a certain, I believe it's a euplectelid glass sponge um, that the operculum is covered um, by a, a thin lattice and it actually locks the mated pair of shrimp inside the um, sponge for the rest of their lives. Wow. And they colonize it when it's younger and then the sponge closes them in and they can never leave again. And then you give that to your future partner <laughs> and say, yeah. We're stuck together now. <laughs> mm, I think we're okay. Another sea cucumber coming up here. Oh, uh, sure. So a question from Van Push Hoover. in on the cucumber in there, Daryl. See is if we can see through it. The uh, the coral or the sponge and its associate being the same color, is it possible that it's because they're eating at the same food source, or the associate is eating something off the coral, that it's allowing it to be the same color? It is. It is certainly within the realm of possibility. I mean, there are lots of examples of organisms picking up their color from their food. Okay, and things like that, it. and they likely, you know. The assumption is that they have a very similar food source is how the commensal or mutualism works. Um, so you, I, it's certainly a reasonable hypothesis. And that sponge, the wedding sponge, is called the Venus Flower Basket Sponge, a.k.a. Wedding Sponge. Yeah, probably sideways in the current there, maybe. Um, look down for a minute and I'll pull that loop out. I think we have a turn in the tether. Maybe come out. Mm. There, it flopped over. Okay, we're good now. So, Dan, can you get a kink in the tether or like a knot in it? Oh, yeah. Causes a lot of work. I was going to say, can you, um, so before you would have to, s to surface, you would have to undo the kink or undo the knot? Uh, if it gets a knot in it and we pull it too tight, the lights go out. We mm -hmm. have to recover the vehicle and change it out. Oh. And it has a uh, minimum bend radius. That's why we're pretty conscious about our uh, tether turns here. We got counters that count uh, both Atalanta and Hercules, and keep keep track of all that. Because you've got a, it, it's you've got fiber comms to the vehicle, right? Yeah, correct. So yeah, yeah there's a, a thin piece. There's several thin pieces of glass running all through that tether. There's, uh, this tether is kind of unique. It has the uh, fibers inside the high voltage conductors, which is something I've never seen before. The 6.8, the armored cable down to Atlanta has the fibers running inside of a steel tube. Yeah, this has been the crinoid dive so far. We've seen lots and lots of them. Yesterday was the anemone dive, and today is the crinoid dive. And only one sea star. That still surprises me. I say yesterday was the floating mysterious orb. That's true. That was that definitely the highlight of yesterday's dive for me. Uh, can we zoom sponge while we're waiting for the ship move? Sure. Go ahead, Daryl. about a 12 or 13 centimeter glass sponge here. 
don't see any associates living with it. All right, I got what I need. Thank you. Tiny little brittle star off to the right oh, there. Oh, yep. In the, on the, yeah, I see it on the, um, on the crust, on the C4. Oh, all right. There it is. Basically, anywhere you zoom out here, you're going to probably see a brittle star. They are actually wildly common. Um, we, we see the big ones living on the corals and sponges, but if you start poking around in the sediment or looking on any of the rocks, uh, there are many, many, many tiny ones. And yesterday you were describing about how common it is in the deep sea to see the echinoderms. Yeah, the deeper you go, they become um, really they're they're kind of one of the masters of the high pressure environments. Okay, you can go wide there. So if anybody wants to, online wants to check out the mysterious orb from yesterday, it's now on YouTube, and it's also on the Nautilus Live website. It's a YouTube short, meaning it's under a minute. Did we get any decent video in, yes. the, uh, in the short? Any stable video, or was it all crazy? Pretty decent. No, it's, uh, uh, it's pretty good. Nothing like trying to image something that weighs less than a gram with a 5,000 pound vehicle. Yeah. Across with a 5,000 <laughs> plus pound vehicle. <laughs> so within one hour of Nautilus posting the videos, we had over 1,300 views on it. Here's a crinoid with a different body posture we've seen. It's kind of got its arms folded in. Hmm. Almost looks wilted. I was going to say, look sad. There's a happy crinoid, there's a sad crinoid. I haven't <laughs> seen any so decapitated on one. ones yet. Um, oh. But wow. something bites off the tip of these things sometimes, and you will see regrowing ones, which we've seen one or two small ones that might have been regrowing. Um, there's so little tissue on there, I can't imagine it has a lot of nutritive value, but something does crop the heads off of these things sometimes, whether it's accidentally, accidental or intentional, I don't know. Okay, it can go light. That is a beautiful shot from Atalanta. So you never did find it out whether they pitched one of the oven weights or not? I can't quite tell on that camera if there's two there or one there. The ballastist, uh, Robert, really, he did some uh, weird engineering calculations that I couldn't keep up with, but he figured it out. It's just perfect. And get rid of our ghetto weights on the front porch there. And yeah. So we got the four four bricks there that so we know what to put on and off with the ramen laser now. I just I know we got four bricks. I don't know if we have uh, one or two Alvins on. So I gotta wonder what the mechanism is here. When you see the brittle stars on the corals, they're often mixed in with the polyps. But on the um, cranoids we're seeing here, the brittle stars are almost always on the stalk and not messing with the actual arms. 
uh, of the crinoid. So I wonder if the crinoid has some some ability to defend itself in some way uh, or to in convince the brittle stars not to be on its actual feeding appendages. Do you think it has something yeah, to do with the stability? Like are the crinoids that, have. you know, like most coral are a little bit stronger all the way up where the crinoid is more like feathery up there? I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's certainly possible. I will say crinoids have more motion control than corals. Mm. They can move, you know, muscularly move all of those fronds, whereas corals can basically retract their polyps and sting things. Um, yeah. But they can sting things and crinoids can't. So, ooh, can we zoom in the cup coral, please? That's the first oh, yeah. one I think we've seen here. Go ahead, Daryl. I heard we lost a sample from... No, we got the cup coral from yesterday. Oh, we did? Awesome. Yeah. See if I can set it down here to get a good tight zoom. Okay. okay this one's got its polyps out, or its arms out, too, so you'll get a better look at you can push right what in these on things look like. These are cool. Full zoom. Sclerotinian. Yeah, so these are sclerotinians. They actually have, like, calcium carbonate aragonate um, skeletons, much more similar to their um, shallow water cousins. Um, and it's it's rare to find um, colonial sclerotinians this deep. In fact, I'm not even sure they get quite this deep um, because they struggle Tilt to, down just a bit in the more acidic deep water waters, to be able to still make their skeletons. The cup corals, a couple different families that make up the cup corals, have evolved the ability to fix aragonite in a in a less you know conducive water environment and can grow yeah. flourish much much deeper. Um, than their colonial counterparts. All right, science is happy, thanks. Okay, it can go in. Yeah, I remember the first time I was handling one of the couple of samples, Delta I Dan was super there. surprised by how hard it was <laughs> because it looks so soft and squishy. No, yeah, that's they're a hard and super there. brittle. You can smash them pretty Showing easily. Showing off. If you're a little too aggressive that's with the forceps, right force picking them up, you can do damage pretty Delta easily. Delta Dan flies again. And they're not like solid, so they do crush, right? They have it's like a, good, a yeah, they have a lot of space, a webbed or a space or a, I don't know what you would call it. Gastrovascular vascular cavity. There you go. Yeah. But they kind of look like baby ice cream cones. <laughs> I can see that. That's when you gotta oh. two hand it. The tilt actually works with either mouse button, which is really weird. We have really moved out of the corals here. So we have a question for Dan online, which is, Dan, you mentioned the steel tube with the fiber. Is the tube protected from the salt water, or does it have to be unspooled and cleaned after each season? Uh, the steel tube I mentioned is actually um, it's embedded in the 6-8 cable, so it's under uh, three layers of steel armor. That's all the uh, 7,200 and 12 meters of armored cable I think we currently have on spooled onto the winch. 2,400 of it hanging over the back of the ship at the moment. Uh, the cable itself, yeah, we do. We uh, That's our lifeline to the ship, so uh, we uh, lubricate it every year and <coughs> on the deepest dive, after the deepest dive, we do a, uh, a freshwater wash down of it, so when it goes back on the drum, it's uh, it doesn't have salt water all over it. Um, we put a um, a football on there that injects grease under high pressure into the armor cable, so it doesn't rust and keeps it lubricated. So it can uh, so it kind of flexes a little as it goes around the uh, traction winch and up out of the hold and over the back of the ship. 
And every year we uh, cut about 10 meters of it off and uh, send that out to be tested to destruction <coughs> and inspected. Okay, go ahead, Daryl, can zoom in there. Do you splice on an additional 10 meters every year then? <laughs> no, no, you can't splice on. Uh, so the cable gets shorter and shorter every year. Uh, that's good, thanks. <coughs> Nice little bamboo coral hair hanging out. You better uh, come up there, bud. Mm -hmm. You can come up uh, a little faster than... Yeah, there you go. You're good there. Looks like it's going to get steep here. <coughs> Something on that rock. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Another nice purple sea cucumber over here. So earlier we were talking about sea cucumbers intestine, and we did have a viewer write back that there are two parts to the sea, sea cucumbers intestine. There's an upper intestine and a lower intestine. I'm trying to find the exact verbiage. Oh, there we go. Okay. So sea cucumbers do not have a stomach. They have an ascending intestine and a descending intestine. Dan, can we take a look at this? Sure. I'm not sure if I'm just seeing rock or... If that's Zoom in there, Daryl. Totally an optical illusion. Never mind. <laughs> Roger. Okay, you can go wide. Thank you. Quick zoom there, Daryl. Oh, the babies. Yeah. Got a little tiny baby stalked crinoid and probably a little tiny baby Chrysogorgia. Yep. Okay, go on. <laughs> Take a look at the whip. Yeah, go ahead, Daryl. This looks like a black coral of some type. I would have called it stickopathies, but I, that br one single branch makes me think it might be a baby something else. Um, so I will, I will not go for a better ID than black coral without going and looking it up. All right, I got what I need. Thank you. <coughs> so that's our third black coral, and all three black corals have been different so far this dive. So, Dan, we have another question for you, which is, do the ROVs have redundancy systems? 
And we're done at, uh, sorry, we're done at what? 